All right, so this is entitled Spinning a Little Out of Orbit, <coughs> a Nightmare. So uh, since we're in no conflict of interest, I have a 60-year-old female uh, presenting with chest pain. She basically had borderline troponins. It's always great when they're a nurse. The whole family are physicians. The only thing worse, I think, would have been if they were malpractice attorneys. <laughs> so right off the bat, I already have some nerve-wracking. This is a, a diagnostic cath done from the right uh, radial approach, and uh, you still frame on the left and, and sitting on the right, and you can see the lack of engagement, heavy calcification, heavy MAC as well. Um, and you can see a high-grade focal lesion uh, right here at the bend of the right coronary. This is the left coronary system, uh, just static film for lack of, uh, and it's very torturous, extremely, extremely torturous. And you can see this lesion up here in the proximal LID. Again, given the situation, the social situation, I thought, all right, well, maybe we'll send this patient for bypass. Uh, we did an assist Navis FFR using IV adenosine, and it was 0 0.72. I thought, okay, well, let's also make certain that this is not uh, something going on with the mitral valve. This is normal LV function. Went up getting an echo, um, basically just showed MAC alone, no mitral stenosis, mild to moderate MR. Uh, everything else looked relatively decent. And so after discussions with her, she wanted to go ahead with PCI of the right coronary. Our plan, even though I'm a radial first operator, was to go femoral. She's not very big. Uh, we're going to do a ultrasound mediated access. I'm a peripheral person, so I really try to use micropuncture and try to prevent uh, RP issues. Uh, AL.75 guide, I'm going to use bivalvarin to decrease the bleeding risk, uh, EBU for the left, but we're really going to start off with the right. My plan was to use orbital atherectomy in this case. And so uh, here's the picture taken through. We always get access under ultrasound and then take a shot through the micropuncture uh, to make certain that we're in the right place and there's no issues with access. And so uh, here we are, again, similar to between a rock and a hard place, trying to get now, I think you can really appreciate with the guide catheter exactly how much calcium you have going on here in the right coronary. This is severe rock. Uh, just being able to get this down, I had to use a microcatheter, and uh, to be able to get the viper wire down. Um, so one of my favorite sayings that I was taught as a fellow is good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. And so I chose very poorly uh, in this case. Uh, and the case here was, I thought, you know, we've got to use orbital atherectomy here. We have to use some sort of atherectomy or else I'm not going to be able to deliver anything around this bend. It's heavily calcified. So we take first run, and immediately the patient says, ouch, uh, which part my heart just dropped and said, this is not going to go in the right direction. Now, fortunately, as everyone set up here, this is a team sport. So thankfully, at that time, I had very senior staff members in the room. Uh, who were prepping the chest as we're trying to go up with a balloon inflation. I always take a, uh, to have a balloon on standby and always take a puff. This is a, a just a very low uh, injection, maybe three cc's, and most of it's going outside the pericardium, into the pericardium. We immediately prep, and this is another, in a different view, you can kind of see how much contrast is extravasating here. This is essentially like a linear split of the calcium, and the whole entire right is, is essentially flayed open. A pericardial drain is now in place. Uh, her, I've also been able to prep the other groin, ask for one of my uh, colleagues to come in and join me to get balloon pump access. Uh, now you can see we got a balloon pump in on the, or we're going up on the right with a balloon pump. We got our first Joe Matter graft master try to seal this. I was not going to try to do a prolonged balloon inflation here. Um, so this is after the first one. We're still seeing continued extravasation. Uh, we put in the second one in at this point. Uh, now we're having relatively slow flow. Uh, she's now intubated. She's on multiple pressors. She's a pericardial drain in. Uh, we're now just trying to salvage and get out of here. So at this point, uh, the PCI, as the flow is going down, we're starting to see some flow down through the, uh, through the distal right, which was beneficial. We had this hairpin turn down on the distal right, uh, which I thought was a challenge. I said, should I walk away? I kept looking at this in a different view. I had several senior partners in the room at this point saying, what do you think? Should we, should we do done, get over to the ICU and try to be done with it? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So now we're going to start to say, is this an edge dissection? In a different view, it's very clear that there's an edge dissection down here below. I thought maybe, just maybe. Now we have a TE probe down from anesthesia, which was able to intubate. We have our cardiac anesthesiologist nearby. Our cath lab's right next to the OR. We have a balloon pump in, pericardial drain in. Uh, and at this point, the anesthesia person is saying, you know, her RV is not moving at all. And we're getting more and more hypotensive. Uh, and we also have this full limb dissection. 
So I thought, well, maybe it's a pseudo lesion. So I pull back, and that was a uh, pull back the wire, doesn't go away. That's a real lesion, that's a real dissection. Uh, fortunately, using uh, we tried low pressure balloon inflation for a few minutes just to see if we can try to get out of here without having to try to deliver a stent through this uh, graft master jungle. Uh, eventually, uh, we're able to get downstream using balloon assisted tracking with the Guidezilla. The Guideliner wouldn't in initially advance. We got a 3520 uh, synergy stent downstream. And then post stenting, now you're going to start seeing, you see how little flow or how little movement is going on in the uh, right system. And I think one of the biggest things to take into consideration is that now we've jailed all the RV marginals. So now we have RV shock. And so at this point, um, we have RV shock, um, and it's where your team sport really comes in. So we did ECMO cannulation in the calf lab, intubated, pericardial drain in. She has RV shock. She gets volume resuscitated. Uh, we have anesthesia, myself, uh, another one of my uh, senior interventionalists, uh, and we're working together to try to stabilize things. And so, uh, interestingly enough, she actually did fine after a, probably a three-week stay in the hospital. She had numerous complications from the ECMO cannulation site from actually uh, bleeding issues more than anything else. She stayed on ECMO for about five days. Her RV recovered. Uh, interestingly enough, I just saw her about, this was about a year ago, uh, she had a positive stress test. We went back to cath. All those stents are now open. She has flow down through her right uh, in an FFR that was negative on the right. I actually went and tried to FFR the LED. It's also negative. And uh, just yesterday, because she was having some atypical pains, I put her on the treadmill, and she went 10 minutes. And I said, thanks. We don't, we'll see you again in six months. So don't come to me with any chest pain. I don't want to do any more caths on you. Uh, or one of my partners will do it. And so uh, choose wisely, never let your successes go to your head, never let your failures go to your heart. This lady's done uh, very well, and it was really just a combination of teamwork in the calf lab uh, to solve, uh, to basically save her from uh, a massive uh, coronary perforation and then the ECMO to kind of rest her RV uh, during that time period. Thanks so much. Great job, any comments from the panel? Hey, yeah, that is a great case. Um, I guess the, uh, the question I have, do you think the dissection was continuing to just extend as you went? And then the other thought I have is we always kind of, a lot of times during cases we ignore RV marginals, but every once in a while um, you get an RV marginal that does something bad. And actually, if you're doing CTOs and you're doing reverse CART, and um, an RV marginal that might ordinarily you get away with when you cover it with the stent, but if you if you push a big flap of tissue from reverse cart, uh, Cal Oswald was telling me about an incredible case, almost identical, where they sheared off a big marginal. It actually wasn't that big, but the patient tolerated it terribly, and they got her out of it by going to ECMO, and she did well. But it was the same scenario. I, I mean, I haven't actually seen that personally, where an RV marginal got you in that much trouble, but I know every once in a while it can get you in terrible trouble. So. Yeah, I think that's, that's the key thing. Uh, we saw a case earlier here today and, uh, where a septal got someone in the trouble with heart block later on uh, on an LED, but I think and the key thing on the right is that those RV marginals can hurt you, and when you cover them up, and the interesting thing is when we took her back for cath, and I, I should have put the films in here, her now RV marginal is filling via collaterals. Mm -hmm which is interesting. So Andrew, could you uh, comment on, I think a lot of us are faced with uh, a lot of comfortability with uh, Rhoda, mm -hmm. you know, and I think, you know, 98% of the time with a 1-5 burn, you modify the lesion um, that you're able to deliver and expand the stent. And now you have uh, the rotational atherect, I mean, the, um, uh, now that you have the, uh, the one that you use, the- Orbital atherect, diamondback. What's that? The CSI. Uh, CSI. The CSI device now with, um, that we're used to Back using in the periphery. I mean, what are people's thought about, um, you know, that lesion clearly needed to be uh, atherectomized and, you know, you used um, CSI and, you know, I think a lot of us would have used Roto that we're very happy with. What are your considerations from people in terms of the type of device? And for you Roto people, what's the impetus to going to CSI? I know the Roto now is going to be in a self-contained system without having to use the gas. And so I think... I'm glad that CSI came because it forced Rota to sort of upgrade their usability. Um, but what, you know, what are people's thoughts as we face this lesion? I mean, we all got to treat that, but boy, we don't want that to happen. Yeah. So yeah. I think you know that's a great point. We have all uh, we have Diamondback, we have Rota, and we have Laser in our labs. Uh, and you know, I, my choice is 
it kind of goes back and forth. Obviously, osteo lesions, I always use rotabud. You can't use uh, Diamondback or else you'll spin out and rip up the aorta potentially. Uh, or even very close to the ostium, you got to be careful. In stent resinosis, or if you're going to get into it, you should never use Diamondback. Um, I think the key thing is understanding when to pull out which device. I think the nice part about Diamondback is that as a radial operator, I can stay six French and go on low and higher speed and get away with a much greater cutting and much more atherectomy than I can with Rota. Obviously, in retrospect, I'm looking at this going, a yeah, one five Burr probably would have done just fine uh, in retrospect. And getting around that, uh, around that curve there, I think it was really the challenge. I think with Rota, you run into that same issue. Uh, Ajay, I don't know if you want to comment on that. You can gutter that pretty well with a Rota, too, and you can be in the same sort of issue. So uh, I don't think there's, um, it is a little unnerving as, as a, you know, you're as a peripheral guy, too, who's used it in the, in the periphery. I remember the first time you've seen this thing wiggle around going, I don't think I want to put this in the corners, but it's amazing. Um, it actually does reasonably well, and we're part of the Eclipse trial, too, so we use a, a fair amount. If you go to the next slide, I mean, there just a couple comments. So first is the new Rotopro, which is now available in limited supply, actually doesn't eliminate the gas. It just eliminates the foot pedal and has a smaller console. Um, but I think this picture is the key picture, because this is before you're doing it. And the challenge with CSI is the Viper only comes with a super extra stiff uh, uh, formulation. You don't have a soft or you don't have a floppy component. And basically, it's not actually the proximal tortuosity, it's that second bend beyond the distal that really has resulted in just pleating of the artery. And if you had this with a Rota XS as well, you'd be very, very hesitant to Rota too. So this is a case, you know, Rota floppy, go very slow and do it. And I personally wouldn't have used CSI for this type of case. Um, I do think there are other advantages to it in other ways, and we'll see how Rota Pro plays out. But w definitely take this picture always and get a sense for what this is going to look like, and, and that's going to be a big yeah, challenge. Yeah, it was clearly a, a mistake, and like I said, uh, it's a good judgment comes from experience, experience from bad judgment. When I saw this, I should have, should have switched over to Rota or just maybe just tried some gentle balloon inflation and see how things were. Yeah, it's just the tortuosity is really killer in this case. Yeah, so isolate it like an RP impella. Um, I think it's a great case. When it's, a, it's great in certain instances. I think uh, we did not have RP impella at the time of this uh, time. Uh, and I think, you know, you do have to take into consideration about the issues of vascular access with ECMO. Is, is There's no doubt that it keeps our vascular surgeons busy. Uh, and, it, it, you know, they're not happy about it. But the patient, the patient walks out of the hospital. Now, she still has persistent issues with groin pain and scar tissue down there. There's no doubt about it. I think RP and Pella here would have been helpful. Um, at the time, it's just, can I get out of the lab alive? Can I get her out of the lab alive? So the scenario that Tom mentioned with the CTOs and sharing off the marginals where you get that RV uh, uh, physiology, um, we've managed with Protect Duo, we've managed with RP and Pella, and actually a balloon pump in that circumstance, not, not this, this is different, but it doesn't really do much because it's all RV physiology. And yep. you can diagnose it based upon a right heart calf in the lab if you don't have a high suspicion for it, and you ride out the RV for a few days and it tends to get better. Um, but it's a, it's a tough scenario to, to sort out. I think the other thing, too, about just Jomed Place, maybe just a couple of quick things about it. The fact that you did atherectomy actually helped you deliver the Jomed. Yeah. There's no way the Jomed would have delivered without atherectomy. So in a weird way, that worked. Um, if it still keeps bleeding, despite putting in the Jomed, then what you can do is you can take a balloon in the Jomed, inflate it in the Jomed, distal and then inject and if you still see bleeding then you know that that's more proximal the perf is more proximal and you need to put the Jomed more proximally because everybody relaxes when they put the Jomed in but in reality it can still bleed yep. and that's the only way you figure it out with these balloon inflations when you do it once the Jomed is in you have to take it up to more than nominal you have to make it really big it's two layers of stent with PTFE in between as well and if you don't take it up high it will thrombose or restenose later, but you're more concerned about thrombosis acutely. So you have to crank that thing up with NC balloons even after you think the perf is sealed, especially because the patient's on pressors, so the vessel's going to be clamped down. And we've had cases of late bleeding after Jomeds where basically once the pressors wear off, then the patient starts bleeding again, then you have to come back and post dilate it again. Yeah, we post dilate this with a 4 or 5, and I think the key thing, like any covered stent, you got to worry about endo leaks, right? So it's a 1A if it's leaking more proximally, a 1C if it's distal. Uh, so you got to look for and make certain that you've actually sealed things up, and it, you'd be, I mean, we go super, especially since it's covered, you can go super aggressive with your post dilatation. Yeah, four fives, 25 atmospheres. Yeah, for, I went to 30. Yeah, you know, go high, high atmospheres.
Great, thanks. Great case, thanks.